Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. It's time for another round of faction tutorials. This time it's going to be Cybran. And I gotta say, I like Cybran a lot. It is probably my most played faction, but not necessarily my favorite faction. I'm going to have a bit more to say about it than the others, but that is also because... Um, it has more and more varied tools than the other factions do, so there is more to talk about. As an overall principle with Cybran, um, they generally have high damage units, a lot of multi-purpose or extremely specific purpose units, and they're fast as a faction, but they tend to have a lot lower health Per mass on most of their units and then they've got some weak areas that we'll talk about but overall they're a fairly strong faction however their fa their strength is in aggression if you try to play defensively with cybern you will lose that is all there is to it cybern cannot defend they will get run over by every other faction easily if you try to turtle or to play defensively. You have to play right from the get-go for map control, for raiding, for aggression, and Cybern will fit you well in that role. Now, just to talk about what we're doing right when we start the game, Cybern ACU is a little bit weaker than the other factions are. Uh, it only has 10,000 health, so right off the bat you're going to have to watch this because you have... Um, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 less than the other factions. If you get directly into an engagement with your ACU, you're a little bit more paper than the others. However, Cybern does have higher regen, even at the base level, and then substantially higher regen once you start getting vets. So you'll have less health overall, but you will be ready to jump back into the fight more quickly because your regen is higher. For your T1 units, this plays exactly into faction strengths. The Mantis is by far the fastest T1 tank, but it has slightly lower health than the other tanks, a slow turret turning speed, and overall will lose mass to mass for with most of the other factions. Um, it does a better job of running down the, the Aeon Aurora than the other factions do, but mostly this is going to play its strength as a raiding unit. You're going to be able to get run buys off more easily with the Mantis than with other tanks because of their speed. And that's going to help you out a lot in the early game. They do have the Lab and the Scout like all the others. Their Scout does have Cloak, not Stealth. It can be seen by radar, but not by vision unless there's an Omni. So you can stick moles around in the map, turn that thing on. It only consumes five power, and you can get instant radar anywhere, and you don't have to worry about this scout getting killed off. So that's a good thing about this one. Um, the Medusa does have a stun effect, even though it is the lowest damage of any of the faction's mobile artillery. So you will want to keep this mixed into your army quite heavily through all tech levels. Because when you get up to the T2 and T3 units, even though this the Medusa is not laying down a ton of damage, it is still a high damage unit, but not a ton of damage... Um, it is going to be able to keep T2 and T3 units stunned at some point. Now, this is also going to be an incredibly handy tool versus the Auroras because if it's uh, it has a good firing rate and AoE combination, even though it is ridiculously inaccurate. So if you keep it mixed in with your forces, um, the Medusa is one of the combat artilleries. It is mass effective when mixed, mixed in with tanks, if I can untangle my mouth. Um... The anti-air unit is a multi-purpose unit. It does have its standard air mode, but then it has a toggle where you can redirect it to do damage to ground. And this actually does more damage than the main tank does, but it's with horrible accuracy and uh, the low health on this unit and non-tracking projectiles. So. It can defend itself in a pinch, but you're not going to want to build this as a mainline combat unit. It's just one of those cool features that you can use if you choose to do so. So your T1 phase is going to be fairly strong on the raiding side and overall is competent as a main battle, uh, battle force. So 
no major issues here. You are going to want to push for T2 relatively early though. Manta's spam will only get you so far versus the other factions and they have the most diverse and possibly the strongest T2 phase and I say that with the caveat that they are not the strongest for brute force. The Aeon will easily overwhelm them with obsidians and shields. The pillar shield combination from UEF does really well versus them. And then the Ilshiva does pretty well for the Seraphims. Um, but you have the massive kiting range of the Hoplite. You have the Viper, which can break any fire base ever made anywhere. You have the Rhino, which is a solid um, mainline battle tank. It's not the best tank, but it is a good unit that packs a lot of mass into a small area. So it will fare reasonably well versus pillars if you have a good number of them. And then it has the Wagner, which is one of the only tanks that uh, the hover tank, or the amphibious tank, this one does not hover, the amphibious tank has a higher damage potential than the mainline battle tank does although it has lower health but with the health statistics the way they are this is actually the most efficient t2 tank to use versus acus because the overcharges um, can only kill them so fast and because they have more damage per tank than the rhinos are these are actually better versus acus not to mention the fact that they have higher speed they're also a stealthy unit that you can jump out with, and stealth plays a huge role in the Cybern uh, way of playing. That is held up by the Deceiver, which is in place of a mobile shield, they have mobile stealth. Stealth anything inside this radius. So you're going to want to mix these in with your T2 army, and you're going to want to especially pair it with Hoplites. Because if you can pair a Stealth and a Hoplite, you can see the tremendous range of the Hoplite as compared to T2 tanks. Um, this is going to be a really effective unit to use. You can kite away. They don't have radar coverage because of the Stealth. They can't see you to shoot at you. And you can stand well outside of vision and attack range and just lay down huge amounts of damage with this Hoplite. And that's going to be something that's relatively difficult for your opponents to guard against, especially in the early game. If you can pack together seven or eight of these and a deceiver or two, you can actually directly go after their ACU and have a fairly good chance of killing it unless he's just got loads and loads of T1 spam packed around him. So... T2 is a good place to be for Cybern. One thing that I will say about Cybern is that their ACU support kind of sucks. Um, the Aeon ACU, as we discussed, has the extra range upgrade, the body shield upgrade, and then the radar upgrade, which complements everything. And then the Seraphim has really strong combat upgrades. Cybern, you have to choose between gun and T2, which is a hard choice to make. And uh, that is going to throw a little bit of a wrench in the works because you have to give up either upgrade to get the other, which is a waste of mass early on. One thing that does make Cybern strong, though, is the early stealth. Stealth is ridiculously cheap. It costs basically nothing, and it makes your ACU invisible to radar, which greatly helps your survivability when you're kiting around things at the T1 phase and trying to use your gun comp. So the gun stealth ACU is very very cheap and highly effective but again you're gonna have to drop the gun upgrade to get t2 later on on your other arm you are gonna have the torpedo upgrade which is stupidly strong in the early navy game you're gonna have a good range on that excuse me still not quite over the allergies that I've been struggling with. Um, that is going to hit this range, which is actually outside the range of destroyers, T1 and T2 subs. You can engage from a long ways away with this torpedo launcher. It does over 200 damage and makes your ACU a in, an invaluable tool versus other navies especially in the early game and i know i didn't talk about navies with the other ones i'm actually going to do a tutorial strictly on naval play that's going to be coming in a couple of weeks um 
I do have to say though, Cyber and Navy plays a key role for their faction because they don't have hover tanks. So if you've got water on the map, you have to build Navy. There is no other option. But to make up for that, they have a ridiculously strong frigate. This thing packs in 16 anti-air DPS and 64 um, unit to unit DPS has 1900 health and costs 250 mass. And those statistics, while I'm not going to compare them to the other factions directly here, that is by far the best stats in just about all categories of any of the frigates for the other factions. And the biggest factor here is the anti-air. Because by the time you get three or four frigates in one spot, they're even going to be able to defend themselves against a T2 gunship um, or even a torp bomber. So these are going to be really, really strong early in the game. And then when you move on to the destroyers and uh, cruisers, the cruisers have one of the highest damage potentials of any of the cruisers in this game, even though they don't have as big of a range. They're another multi-purpose unit that you're going to be able to switch to ground firing mode, which turns out a ton of damage even though these projectiles don't track and then it has a main deck gun which makes this very good at defending itself you're going to be able to build strictly cruisers without building accompanying destroyers as long as your opponent is not exhibiting a large naval force and then the salem is probably one of the better well-rounded naval units it has decently strong anti-air it has 80 range good damage on the front gun high fire rate even though it is slightly inaccurate and it walks on land which brings us back to the t2 transitioning to t3 phase this has 80 range which is almost as much as your t3 mobile artillery the trebuchet what that means is you can actually take a choice between um, building T3 mobile artillery and building the Salem. If you've already won naval superiority with your early naval game, you can pull your uh, your destroyers back, leave your frigates out to protect from re-entry into the water from the other guy and also as an anti-air buffer. Um, you can leave your cruisers and frigates out there and you can bring your destroyers back Take them on land and use them as a siege weapon. These are extremely good at knocking out fire bases. They turn out high, consistent damage. They have much higher damage potential than the T3 mobile artillery and are also a little bit better at directly engaging units. But because of the slow walking speed and the little bit of a targeting issue when they're targeting single or groups of three or four T1 and T2 units, you're gonna to wanna to mix these in with a lot of support tanks. Um, just keep them back, use them as a support weapon and hit from range to clean things up for your advancing land force. So that gives Cybern another option. Cybern Navy T1 and T2 is a pretty cool thing that you're gonna to wanna to use as often as you possibly can. Now shifting over to the T3, uh, well, let me talk about the air game. Um, Cybern is the only faction that has a gunship at all four tech levels. I don't know if that's ever occurred to anyone. It's, it's not a real apparent trait, but when you sit and think about it, T1, T2, T3, T4, all gunships. And each one has its strengths and weaknesses. Let's talk about the Jester. Um, as I was saying before, Cybern is a rush faction. They have a high AOE bomber, which is extremely good at knocking out large groups of NGs. Um, this is going to be an invaluable tool for killing off build power and for damaging power generators and such. You can see the spread on that. And then the Jester is going to be awesome for raiding single targets. You, it is a relatively expensive unit. It is basically a T1.5. It costs almost as much as a T2 unit, but it's available at the T1 phase. It's slightly less mass efficient to build than T2 though. So you don't want to build a lot of these, but if you can build up to, I would say five or six of them and use them for rating purposes, they do really, really well. They have high damage potential. Um, obviously they're pretty agile. They can get from one end of the map to the other relatively quickly. And they're just a good unit to exploit. They're kind of cheese. They're either going to be really super overpowered because your opponent's not going to have enough anti-air or 
your opponent's going to have a lot of anti-air, and these aren't going to fare very well because they don't have the high health numbers um, needed to survive sustained anti-air fire. If you're going to build more than five or six gestures, I usually recommend moving to T2 and building Renegades because Renegades have far higher health per mass than the gestures do, and they have AOE on their main gun. Um, so that will allow them to knock out more engineers more quickly than the Jester will, along with having a higher fuel capacity and the higher health markers. So they're going to be more survival. And you can see that. The Jester here, hitting one pinpoint spot. The Renegade has almost like the Nanite missile from the Corsair. It's going to hit a fairly large area. I think it's 2 AoE, if I'm not totally mistaken, or 1.5. It's going to be able to damage four or five engineers at a time. So you're going to want to make use of that in your raiding game. Same thing goes for the T2 bomber. High, high area of effect. Extremely good sniping tool. Able to rake across and destroy large amounts of land units or hit single targets to high effect. And one thing about this bomber is that it's actually able to fire basically straight down. Um, well, that was not a good example. Um, it's able to fire at angles out from the plane. It's got a very high degree of maneuverability on that. So T1 and T2 air game is very strong for cyber and attack wise. You're going to have to rely on interceptors because it has the worst T2 bomber anti-air support. Um, but it, it is a very useful tool that you can use. Shifting to the T3, Cybern does decently well on drops. They have a six capacity T1 transport and... Uh, 10 capacity I think yes T1 4 I'm trying to remember here it is 5 T2 units and then 2 T3 units if I'm not totally mistaken on that um, so it does fairly well as a drop tool one thing that you do need to keep in mind though is that you can use the deceiver on the transport and this is where the biggest strength comes in you can load a deceiver onto the transport and it will stealth the transport and everything in it so you can get off stealth drops very handy tool and then one other thing I do need to mention is the fire beetle drops um, these it is a slightly manipulative tool that I'm going to explain how to use here so that you guys know um, what's going to happen what you do is before you load the transport you need to um, select your fire beetles and then you're going to choose a target wherever you're at and you're going to load the transport and while it's traveling place your attack order on whatever unit you want to kill and what that means is as soon as this fire beetle drops it is primed and ready to hit the target that you pre-targeted so this is going to cut out any wait time that could possibly be there Second thing, you need to use the Shift G command when you have multiple fire beetles. This means that all fire beetles will run in a straight line to the target as fast as possible and not try to get, get in formation or circle the unit like a group of fire beetles do if they're working as a um, working as a group on a single order. So you're going to want to do that. So it's it is board transport attack Shift G. And then you're just going to want to drop right next to whatever you're killing. And the coup de gras of the fire beetle drop is if you have a unit that is walking in a certain direction, if you can manage to drop the fire beetles in the course of that unit moving, just like that, right there, that fire beetle would detonate midair as soon as the docking clamp releases and that's how you see people detonate fire beetles literally on someone's head and make that instantaneous explosion that everyone loves if they're dealing it and everyone hates if it's happening to them now as far as denying that this is going to be even more important for people because uh the fire beetle drop is a nasty individual that you want to avoid at all costs basically when you see a transport full of fire beetles headed towards you, you want to stop moving because a transport cannot land directly on top of another unit. There is a 
pathfinding issue there and you can see it'll look at it it'll find a spot of ground nearby and it'll drop over there but um if you're walking you walk into the path of the transport which is how they get you so you're going to want to stop moving so he can't drop directly on top of you and you're going to want to throw up um, either some wall sections around your ACU to try to disrupt the pathing of the fire beetles and also prepare yourself to overcharge the group when it drops. Or you can build a factory under the transport as it's coming down and the fire beetles will drop into the building factory and auto detonate. So if somebody is going to use a questionable tactic to midair detonate fire beetles directly on top of your ACU, I would say that it is safe to use a possibly questionable tactic of building a building underneath where the transport's landing that wasn't there before, which causes the uh, units to detonate on landing. So it, it's kind of a uh, exploit versus exploit war here, but it's a really cool one because it's fire beetles and it's basically playing instant death. So that's going to be one of your cyber strategies. And that's basically what I wanted to talk about here. There's a ton of stuff that you can do with Cyber and that you just can't do with other factions. Um, when you're moving from T2 to T3, which I would recommend doing reasonably early with Cybern because Cybern has a lot of really strong T3 units you're going to want to take advantage of. Um, you're going to move, and I would recommend building Loyalists first. Now, Loyalists... They're very fast. They're technically a raiding unit, similarly fit to the role as a Titan, but they're much stronger than the Titans are for UEF. Um, they have very good damage. They have an EMP stun blast when they die, so you can actually kamikaze these guys into groups of units to stun them perpetually and also use them against GC, so they're picked up with the tractor claw and they stun the GC when they die. Um, so you're going to want to build these fairly early on. One other thing that they're useful for is they have a boomerang effect on TAC missiles. They do have TMD, uh, which I'm not sure which of those nubs on its head is the TMD. I think it's the little black one right there, the round one. Um, when a TAC missile comes in in a very, very tiny radius, like maybe that big around this unit, it's even slightly smaller than the Aeon TMD range. It will return that TAC missile directly to sender, um, which can be, it can obliterate Navy if you're not careful because the TAC missile is not recognized as enemy, it's recognized as friendly since you launched it, but it gets returned and kills the unit that launched it with the AOE blast. So the only thing that you're going to have to be mindful of is that the Loyalist this, no matter what trajectory the TAC missile comes in at, it is going to launch it basically in a flat line with the ground directly back to the target. So if you're launching from a TAC launcher on this side of the mound and you're launching and the Loyalist catches it, it's going to impact the mountain on the way back. But it makes awesome TMD, it is portable TMD, and it is returning TMD. So that makes it very strong. Your mainline battle unit is going to be the brick, which is roughly equivalent to a Percival, but will lose mass for mass to a Percival. Has the same range, has 375 DPS instead of 400, and slightly less damage, I think. Very slightly less damage. Um, or, or less health. I'm sorry, less health. But uh, it does fare very well, and it definitely demolishes the other two factions, Aeon and Seraphim, at the T3 stage given that your opponents aren't doing the right things like building lots of sniper bots, building lots of T3 mobile artillery and shielding their armies. Now the trebuchet is an awesome anti-unit tool. It is by far the best anti-unit T3 mobile artillery. You're going to want to use it as often as possible. It has extremely high area of effect, brutal damage laid down into any army of T1 and T2 units. It's just going to wreak havoc. It's also very good at softening up incoming T3 units. So three or four trebuchets thrown into a mix of 
roughly equal numbers of Percival's and Bricks, the Bricks are going to win by a very wide margin. Because even though the Trebuchets aren't dealing a lot of damage to any single target, they're going to soften up the group as a whole by a great deal. So you're never going to want to be without your Trebuchets. That can literally be the difference between life and death for your T3 land army. And then they have, in my opinion, the coolest T3 mobile anti-air unit. It's just awesome looking. It's a scorpion who couldn't love it. And uh, that is going to let you knock down T3 air unit. So that is the T1 through T3 uh, phases. If you're going to talk a little bit more leaning towards the end game, for your air options, you have the Stealth Strap Bomber, which is a ridiculous tool. This thing is so frustrating to deal with. Unless you have Omni, you will never see it coming. It will bypass a lot of your defenses. By the time your SAMs see it, your T3 anti-air is not going to be able to kill it before it drops its bombs, and it has the highest area of effect of any bomber. So these guys are absolutely the best at knocking out single targets from under stealth for that late game last ditch snipe attempt and they're also good at knocking out uh or dealing area damage to bases and that kind of thing uh the asf is also stealth has the lowest health numbers by far of any asf uh will lose to any other factions asf number for number if you're microing and you mess up even once but if you just uh, patrol order or move order and stop into a group cyber and asf in dogfights will kill an equal number of the other factions asf in a one-on-one -on -one level engagement so these guys are extremely good to use not to mention you can throw the stealth on them and pop up out of nowhere because your opponent can't see from which direction you're coming since they don't have radar coverage Spy plane is normal, and we talked about everything else. The Whaler, there's another progression in this. We got one, two, three, four tier gunships. We've got direct fire, area of effect, direct fire, area of effect, every other tier. The Whaler has high health numbers, 5,900. It has a radar jammer, which means that it will spoof SAMs. Um, when the gunships are incoming, the first volley of T3 anti-air will be wasted because it's going to hit the false radar blips and not actual units. A lot of people underestimate the actual potential of the, uh, of the radar jammer on this air unit. It is a good thing to have. And then it, is, it does do a lot of damage. It does very well for itself. Um, as far as DPS goes. Not quite as good as the broadsword, but it is roughly comparable. Um, and then the T4 gunship, which has basically no anti-air. You're going to have to support this thing with an active air force. You're not going to be able to send it in. Even 15 ASF will kill it dead. I think it only loses like one ASF in that situation. Um, or a, a huge amount of interceptors, one or the other, to cover this thing. It is dealing 120 anti-air damage times 2, so 240. I think I figured it up one time, and if you send 20 ASF, it kills the Soul Ripper in like 20-something seconds, and it only loses 1 or 2 ASF. So it, it is a weak, weak unit versus air, but versus ground, you're packing in 2,600 2, damage, I think, um, on a fairly, fairly good area of effects. So this is going to be a demolisher of worlds as far as bases are concerned now as far as your land options go you've got two mainline units the monkey lord and the megalith and this is going to let you um the monkey lord is a nice complement to a t3 army it is an easy t4 to rush it only costs 1900 or 19,000 mass my bad um, it does 4,000 damage per second as a good walking speed, but it has relatively short range. It has about 500 damage on the electron bolters, which are the yellow circle out here. So you can kite T1 and T2 armies and vet up off of them effectively. You do not have to directly engage. And then as far as T3 units and base confrontations go, just don't do it. Don't do it at all. The Monkey Lord is not meant for that. Um, so if you try it, you'll lose it. 
Uh, you're going to want to engage from the edge of the army and tear through from the side. Do not directly engage the main flank head on. Uh, you're going or the main group. The flank is the side. You're going to want to engage from the flanks um, and pick off Percival's opponents, bricks, Othams, harbingers, all that kind of thing in groups of two or three, if at all possible. And the Monkey Lord vets very quickly. So you can actually get your mass worth out of it that way, as long as you don't just throw it head first into a large group. Uh, that is the main mistake people make. They think, oh, it's a T40 unit, it's invincible, and they throw it directly into the melee, and it dies, and it's a mass donation. Don't want to do that. Uh, this thing does have a stealth field. It is a, let me see here, where are we at? I cannot see it. I think it is the same as the attack ring right here. It provides stealth, mobile stealth to any units inside its radius. So you can actually bring flak and tanks with you and the monkey lord will keep them all stealth. So it's a very useful ability. The Megalith is the king of the T4 direct fire experimentals. It has the most range, one of the highest damages, the most health of any other T4 unit in the main combat category, but it does also cost the most. This is a ridiculously expensive son of a gun, but if you can build it, it does really well for itself. It can also reclaim things out on the battlefield. If you place an egg for a unit to build on top of a wreck somewhere in order to start the egg it first clears the area with reclaim so you can reclaim huge amounts of mass if you park this over a t4 and try to lay an egg on top of the wreck um, so you're going to be able to march the megalith in wherever you want to go you can lay down a t3 engineer and a couple of anti-air units to support has a limited build queue but it has what you need to get a new base started this is also an excellent naval support tool it is going to have torpedoes i believe it is the largest green cert no hold on maybe the anti i hate when the units ranges are overlapping um, i think it is the red circle for both the main gun and the uh, and the torpedo damage but this thing will actually stand up to um, a small group of t3 subs pretty well it can slug out a torpedo war with the tempest or with the um with the Atlantis fairly Atlantis fairly well. So you're not going to want to forget about this in a naval game. I wouldn't build it as a specifically designated naval unit, but it is definitely not a bad thing to have in your navy. One other thing to mention about it is that its guns are high mounted. If you can see the top of the megalith in the water, it can probably shoot. So it's going to be able to deal huge amounts of damage to other battleships and any naval units that are sitting in your bay makes a good defensive tool and then the scathus which is technically a mobile unit but also classified as a t4 artillery it is mobile it does ridiculous amounts of damage it is absolutely absurd how much damage this thing can do has really good range you can see it reaches pretty much the whole map on twin rivers uh, if you park in the back it reaches well over halfway on the map so you can use this as an area denial tool into which pretty much no enemy units can enter because it just wipes clean the face of the earth wherever it strikes. You can see it does have a minimum range right there. So Cybern has a lot of options. This video has actually gone on a little longer than I planned on it taking. Um, there are so many things that you can do with Cybern, so many things that you can... I would say exploit, but it's not a game exploit. It is exploiting the strengths of the faction. Lots of things you can do, but there are uh, some very major weaknesses. Um, their T4s do not engage very well with other with other factions T4s, unless you're talking about the Megalith, which costs substantially more. Your T2 mainline tanks are a bit weaker than other factions, although the hoplites are good. Um, their T2 air phase is weak at anti-air capabilities, but they have the strongest combat options for air. Um, it, it is a give and take for the whole faction, up to and including they have the worst point defense and shield values, 
but they have the best mobile missile launcher by far hands down and the best tack launcher so like I said, give and take. If one thing doesn't work for you, try a different one, and usually the aggressive option is the better option with Cybern. Hopefully that will give you guys a better idea of how to play this faction through. If you want exact values for units, health numbers, cost numbers, uh, price point comparisons versus other factions' units, you're going to want to check out my unit tutorials where I do tier by tier uh, all of the units for all four factions with comparisons as far as spec sheet comparisons go. This is directly catering to your strategy needs, how the units function, how to use them, where they fit into the army. So hopefully this will help you guys. Maybe you learned something you didn't know. Hopefully the fire beetle mechanic and the prevention of fire beetle snipes mechanic will be useful to a lot of you. And with that, I am out of here. That is going to be the end of this tutorial. I hope I'll catch you guys on Thursday for the normal game cast. Also, if you're interested at all in Heroes of the Storm, I am starting to regularly cast Heroes of the Storm gameplay, my own gameplay for now. Hopefully, I'll be picking up replays from you guys if you play it. Uh, go ahead and send those replays over. I'd be more than happy to cast your games, and I'll start unit to, or hero tutorials on them as well probably next week. All right, I'm out of here, guys. Thanks, as always, for watching. I will catch you in the next video.